Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. So Greg, you're back on the podcast. Welcome. So glad to have you. Kerry, it is my pleasure to be back with you. We got chatting and you're like, have we better just, we should just hit record. I'm like, yeah, we should hit record. So we're talking about you getting into the podcasting game about a year ago in the middle of the pandemic. So what are you, what are you learning about that? Well, the, the very thing I was about to share with you about it is, is that I'd had uh, Benjamin Hardy on my show. Um, and one of the things he said is, ask yourself this question. Are you in the gain or are you in the gap? Hmm. And I love this question. So what he means by it uh, is, are you spending time looking at the, the gap is everything from where you are to where you want to be, who you are compared to who you want to become. That's the gap. The gain is where you're looking at how far have I come? What progress have I made? Mm. Who have I become that I wasn't before? And he just made this simple point, which is that you can be successful in either category. In fact, you just are whatever level of success you are in any given moment. Right. But if you get in the gap, you will be unhappy and if you're in the game, you will be happy. So that's, that's the point he's making. If you spend the vast majority of your time looking at what you have not yet achieved, hmm. the ideal that you cannot live up to fully yet, you can be successful, but you won't feel it. You will just feel the pain of the gap. And so I find that question to be a powerful question. Uh, and of course, the context was with launching uh, the What's Essential podcast uh, about a year ago. Uh, we're just about to hit the, the million download mark. Um, and, you know, it depends which way you look at that as to how you feel about it. If you're in the gap, I mean, you can always do more. Oh, uh, Joe you, Rogan you know, has a couple more downloads than you and me combined and multiplied well, by 10, right? Well, exactly. So if you, if you compare yourself to uh, Joe Rogan, if you, if you forget, oh my goodness, well, he's actually been on a multi-year journey to get to where he is, um, Oh, that's the main thing that he's doing. Oh, like if you forget that there's trade-offs other people are making to achieve certain things and you just compare what you're doing against it. On the other hand, you say, well, uh, literally uh, knew nothing about podcasting a year ago. We, we launched, we went into it. It's been this tremendous adventure. Uh, the podcast just became top five on, uh, on self-improvement, uh, top 10 on education on, on Apple. I mean, in education alone, there's 66,000 podcasts. Yes, yeah. uh, so to be in the top, uh, you know, top 10 of them it is, is real progress and, and oh. is actually delightful. And get, can you celebrate the progress you're making in your life uh, and, and in small ways and big ways and just take the time? And so, you know, I think that's a theme. I struggle with this. I struggle with, and most, most overachievers um, struggle with spending just too high of a ratio in the gap. Uh, and I, I certainly do. Oh, I, I, I can play that game too. I don't know whether you know this. And by the way, I, I said it before we did start hitting record, but like a million downloads is a serious deal in podcasting after a year. Like you just, you need to know that. And I remember reading a quote years ago, I think this happened in the 90s, but Ted Turner, you may remember it, donated a billion dollars to the UN. I remember and it. Yeah, he was he was interviewed. I remember that video and that precise moment, by the way. It like okay. made an impact on me, but go ahead. Yeah, I don't know whether you caught this part or not. Hopefully this was years ago. My memory is correct. But they asked him, how does it feel? And hmm. he said, well, like, okay, but like compared to what Warren Buffett can do with his money, it feels like nothing. And I'm like, dude, you just like, that's a paraphrase, but I'm like, you just donated a billion dollars to the UN, to the United Nations, like, 99.999% of the planet can't do that. And you feel like it's not enough. Like at a, at a certain point as a leader, you just have to say, man, you're in the podcast game. Now, 
and and a million downloads and top 10 in your category in in Apple Podcasts. Like that is that's incredible. So I was saying I loved Effortless, which we're going to talk about today. We'll talk about essentialism, but like you're going to be on my playlist. Like Cal Newport, who started around the same time you did. I listen to him quite regularly. Adam Grant's in it now. Simon Sinek, uh, who've all been on the show this year. Seth Godin started, I think, two years ago with Akimbo. So they've all been on. And like, man, it's just it's just fun. Do you notice, are you traveling yet, Greg, since uh, Effortless came no. out? Are you still in lockdown? Uh, no, not really. Um, I've been... Oh, see, I shouldn't really say this, but I'm so I'm so happy about that. Um, <laughs> so I, I haven't jumped on a plane either. I I love traveling, and I yeah. love traveling for events, and I love speaking, and I've done you know I've done a bit of it. Um, and just before the pandemic, for the first time in years and years of travel, I just remember packing again. It'd been and and just going really. Are you doing this again? I, this is the first time I'd had that. In all the years before, I just felt so grateful. Oh, oh, it's another group that wants to hear from you and you get to teach and it just felt so, it did feel relatively effortless. And uh, and, and then all of a sudden I just was like, Oof. and that was right before the pandemic. And so it was just a great, personally great opportunity to just break. And, um, and, and very fortunately, uh, the, the you know the subject matter that I write about in essentialism and effortless seems to be relevant right now, and so so actually there is there has been I would estimate that right now there is probably double the demand for the ideas in essentialism and now in effortless as well as there was pre pandemic, mm. but the difference is I'm not traveling and so it's making it possible to even do you know, even deal with, with, with the demand that's coming in. Um, because there's just a limit to travel. I don't, I don't like, I don't want to travel more than a certain amount. I put a very, you know, an upper bound on it. And when I do travel, I travel with one of my children, I have four children now. And, uh, and so we'll, we sort of make into a family, you know, an experience, a, a, a daddy, son, a daddy, daughter moment. Um, so anyway, you're, you're going somewhere different with this question about travel. Oh, but but I, I'm curious in that. Do you think you'll travel because I am going somewhere with it? But do, do you travel? You think you'll travel more or less when you're back on a plane? I, I'm going to be less. Uh, I've thought about this so much. Um. Yeah, that I I completely agree with you. Yeah. Uh, I I feel there was a there was a poll in the UK. Uh, that found a, a YouGov poll that found that only 8% of Britons wanted things to go back to the way they were before. Isn't that interesting? Wow. And so it's not just that, obviously people don't want the pandemic forever. Yes. They don't want that. Even if, even if their pandemic experience has been a, a more positive one than some people's, right? For some, of mm -hmm. course, it's been devastating uh, and lost loved ones, uh, wrecked careers, wrecked businesses. I mean, obviously, this is, this, this is a not equally uh, experienced uh, pandemic. Uh, but even those that are in the, in the, you know, hey, it's been quite good, they don't want this. They don't want the isolation. They don't want the uncertainty. You know. uh, but that's not the same as wanting to go back. I, just, I was just talking to Kim Scott on the podcast, and she said, I don't know if we said this when we were on air or not, but I thought this was so clever. You'll like this. Yeah. She's all into two by twos, right? Both of her books are based on two by twos. And she said, yeah, I love a two by two. She says, here's a two by two I think we need to use right now. She said, on the one axis is love and hate. And on the other axis is before the pandemic and in the pandemic. Hmm. That makes sense, right? So you can kind of, visualize yeah. it so that you can analyze which things did I love and hate before? Which things do I love and hate through? Oh, yeah. So that you I can get it. design try to design a life where the things you loved before and the things you love through the pandemic become your new lifestyle. Hmm. I, I think that's a good transition for us, too. right? I think that's something yeah. we really want to do. That is Russian. brilliant. I have been living in that two by two, I think for the last 15 months or so, just thinking about how are things going to be different permanently? And I think you're right. Well, where I was going down this like circuitous rabbit trail <laughs> was it'll be interesting as a podcaster now because you sold I, essentialism sold over a million books you hit uh, the New York Times list overnight with effortless congratulations on that thank you it's a fantastic book 
But what's interesting is you've always been an author to this point, and suddenly you're in people's earbuds day in, day out, every single week. And so when I land in a city, and I've been podcasting, as you know, you've been a guest a number of years ago as well, but I've been doing this for seven years, six and a half years. And it's interesting because my written material actually has a greater circulation than my podcast. Podcast has done incredibly well, but we're pushing 20 million downloads, which is insane. But my written material has more traction than that. Now, what's interesting though, is when I land in a city, nobody Hmm. talks about my writing. They Hmm. all talk about the podcast, which Hmm. is so fascinating to me. And if you think about the podcast you listen to, I think, and this is an argument for leaders to start a podcast or at least be in people's AirPods from time to time, is they feel like they're my friend. Mm -hmm. Like I was, and I wonder if you're going to see that when you jump back on the road that people go, oh, Greg, I love you. Listen, loved effortless, loved essentialism, but I love your podcast, man. It's incredible. I'll tell you what I, my, my experience with that right now. So I've been doing a lot of events virtually as you know, you'd imagine and what's funny for me is when I'm talking to somebody, either on air or off air, and they'll say, oh, yes. And somebody said the other day to me, they said, they said, oh, yeah, I can't believe that Anna, Anna and you, would, you know, did, did, did that last night. And or something, I don't know what they said. And I was like, I just didn't even know what they were talking about. And what they were talking about was an episode that I recorded a few weeks ago with my wife that, that had landed yesterday. And they were listening to it. And in their mind, I would know what was in that because... It right. felt almost live to them. And, and, and it was, these moments are very funny because you forget what you've said. Anything you write in a book, you have to think about it, design it. It goes through editorial process multiple times. I mean, by the time it comes out, it's, it's gone through all sorts of iterations and cleansing processes. With podcasts, it's not like that. It's raw. It's, you know, it's, it's personal. It's what's just happened. You're referring to the things from yesterday. And so, yes, I actually do think that you're right. If, and, and, and I think people probably do know you a bit better than mm-hmm. it's not exactly two way still, but they are aware of things that, that they wouldn't be in a book. So I do think it's a very personal medium. And that's what I love about it uh, is, is just the chance to, you know, just, just to talk to people, have a conversation. We've yeah. done some things. I'll tell you what we've done a couple of times. Well, mm. a couple of times, like 10 times, is we have people on and I'll just do an essential intervention with them. So it's like an everyday mm. person. So we've had big stars, right? You know, big names. Um, but I have really loved the everyday people. Just, hey, they have emailed me. They reach out. This is a challenge I have trying to, you know, try to live these ideas, uh, trying to be an essentialist. Uh, this is what's hard for me. And we'll just literally do a live coaching session with them. Uh, and I have found that to be enjoyable. And I think other people have enjoyed listening to it too, because you just get to see what does it really look like to apply this. Isn't that uh, interesting yeah. on this show? Because I've seen a number, we tried it in different forms before, but starting in August or September, uh, I'm going to do live coaching at the end of the show for people. Oh, really? We write in similar space. You've, you've had a chance, I think, to see at your best, my next book. And, um, you know, I'm just going to coach people through some of the challenges they have with energy management, time management, um, hijack priorities, et cetera. So what do, you, what do you love most about that? What do you enjoy about that the most? Um, I, I do an intervention in a particular way, and it's, it's, a, it's a listening process. So it's a real discovery. So I never know where it will go because I don't have an agenda of – okay, I've got to get this person to change this thing or make this kind of decision or I, I don't feel limited at all in that. And so I'm just sitting there listening like everybody else is, like just really, I mean, I've spent the last 20, 20 25 years really passionately interested in deep listening and deep empathy, and why it's necessary and what happens when you use it. And and so that's that's what I love is just, listening and going layer by layer and going deeper and deeper in understanding why something is hard for somebody, what's getting in the way of them actually being able to do the thing that they feel is important and want to do. Uh, I, I love that discovery process. The, the solution, once you get clear understanding, is often very easy and very doable. Uh, the problem is it's so 
so messy in people's minds, so complicated. It just they've got so so emotional and so messy. They can't even get to the thing. Uh, and so my job is just to try and you know get past all of that, so that we can get to the little thing. There's always I feel like there's always a metaphorical little red button inside all the complexity. And if you can get to it and you press it, it just all will suddenly work. Um, so I love that discovery process. You see, that resonates with me, Greg. I love where this interview is going, by the way. Thank you for just saying hit record and we'll just, we'll just <laughs> do, do it this way. It's, it's brilliant. It feels like lunch or dinner, which is always my favorite. Um, yes. What, what I like about that, what's interesting and what's different is often people in your space, you know, New York Times bestselling authors, sold millions of books, you know, blah, 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 public profile you would be the expert who would be responsible for sound bites. So you show up at an event, you're like, well, as I said, on page 118 of Essentialism, blah, blah, blah. What's interesting and counterintuitive is you're into deep listening. Why do you take that approach? Because you could just, you know, be the advice dispenser. Here's your problem, you know, insert credit card. Here's the solution kind of thing, almost like a like robotic, but you're really into listening. Why, why that approach? is it's 10 times more effective, literally. I, I think about it like this. I think that there's three levels of influence, of interpersonal influence. One is someone who is nice. Maybe they don't interrupt you very much. They're kind of, they would generally be, so, oh, that person's such a, such a good listener, right? but actually they're not very persuasive or impactful. There's that type, that's like level one. Uh, nice, but not impactful. Then there's level two, which is where you're, you're impactful because you've learned how to articulate, you know, boldly, or, you know, you've, you've, you've learned how to write uh, well, uh, speak well, you know, and, and I, I don't even have names for these three levels, but that's mm -hmm. level two. Um, you know, you sort of imagine someone as a lawyer who just is, uh, you know, can put together an argument, formulate it, uh, you know, argue the case. That's had level two. And I think that a lot of leaders uh, basically don't want to be level one. They want higher influence than that, so they move to level two. And then they get coached, but look, you need to listen more. You know, that's becoming a problem. And, and they, they're caught in a, a cognitive dissonance because they don't want to go down to the level. It seems like a demotion to them in, in terms of influence. Mm -hmm. they're like, I don't, you tell me to listen more, but that means being like these people, these nice people have no impact. I don't want to do that. And so they get stuck between these two, unaware that there's a third level of influence. And that's this deep listening. Um, that's, it's a complete game changer. Uh, because if you can, if you can, let's say, know your agenda, know, understand yourself, and then you can put that aside, right? You put your agenda aside, um, so that you can understand the other person deeply, correctly, accurately, exactly to their satisfaction. Then you can move to sort of step three in a process, which is you can now speak with all those abilities that you have to communicate, but in words that are exactly what the other person, the, the way the other person is most likely to receive it. You'll know which thing is relevant, which thing isn't, but you'll also find the right words to express it so that they're open to it. They're also not battling to be understood. So where they can't even absorb anything that that's resolved. So now they're open. So it increases their openness and your precision and accuracy. So you become a 10 X influencer. That's the difference, right? There's like, there's what I call like half X down here, one X here, and then 10 X is above. That's why I am so fascinated. How did you, how did you stumble on that? How did you, how did, you said 20 years? That's a long time. How did you yeah, do that? Actually, it's even longer than that. Um, yeah. It just feels a little weird to say it's even longer, but it is 25 years now. And, huh. um, and I've been preparing to write about this for a long time. I'm going to say, it sounds like a book to me, Greg, to be honest with you. 
Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think so too. Um, but I, I mean, 25 years ago, um, I was on a church mission and unusually, surprisingly, Stephen Covey had come to the mission twice just to speak. He must have known the president of the, the mission. Uh, and so I, I sort of got into the seven habits at that time and in a fairly deep way by the end of it, and particularly habit five, which is seek first to understand, then seek to be understood. I had experienced it the first time I went to, out to practice it, right? Like, okay, I, I'm, I'm big into that. Anyway, as soon as I've learned something, I, I, don't, I don't want to talk about it. I want to go do it instantly. And so as soon as I heard about read about it and listened and understood, okay, this is how to do this. I was like, okay, I need to practice right now. And the first time I did it, I was talking to some cynical people <laughs> who weren't, I mean, I'm there on a sort of proselyting mission, sharing, you know, trying to share the gospel, trying to share something that, that might make a difference. And uh, they were just like, I don't know, they're just full of cynic, cynicism. Hmm. And, and in the past, I think I would have been like, you know, I would have been at that, like, try to be a one X or where I'm going, well, let me just try and tell you, you know, being a teller, I'll tell you why I believe this. I'll tell you why I think this is important. And, and, and then you just like, you know, how is it tinkling? What's the phrase? Help me out with it. Uh, mm. Tinkling brass, tinkling cymbal. Uh, oh, yeah. Clanging like, gong, clanging cymbal. Yeah. yeah. yeah you're, first like, you're, like, you're, you're not making an impact. The, the other person still of the same opinion as they were before. They don't feel understood and so on. So I went through this practice with them and it was unbelievable. It worked exactly as promised. It was exactly immediately so there wasn't even like a big skill development process for some reason it was like instant and they were so open by the end of an hour of me listening to them it was they were completely different people hmm. and, and to, to 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 say it it was like i mean i don't know if it's the right metaphor but like you know eating out of your hand kind of metaphor they're just yeah, like yeah. totally open wow. okay what do you want to say and the power of that difference i just walked away changed i was like Okay, that please. I want to understand why that worked. I want to do that again. I want to. I want to share it with other people. And by the end of my mission, after I I was at law school, I'd gone to law school um, a little. I don't know. Foolishly, it's quite too strong a word, but like unnecessarily, let's say. I get that so journey. Mm -hmm. Did you? So yeah, I quit I'm a law school grad. Yeah. Well, I didn't make it through to a grad. <laughs> I, I quit after just just before the end of the first year and and started this journey of teaching and writing and it's obviously you know it's been a good choice. Um, but I got to know Stephen before he passed away and talked to his team about actually co-authoring a book with him on this subject. Hmm. And there was appetite to do it, but I just didn't feel ready to do it, as I've just been holding on to it now for for the last. Uh, this last 25 years, not holding on to it sta statically, but like using it and learning about it and and developing it and understanding it and and it, it, you know I do think it's time time to to, to get to get on with it. I'll be excited and, uh, for that. Yeah, well, I I see too. <clears throat> as soon as you as soon as anyone who gets into essentialism essentialism and effortless, right? Anyone who goes, oh yeah, these these ideas are helpful to me. Um, personally, will almost immediately face the problem of having to deal with it interpersonally. You say, okay, well, this thing is essential to me, or I'd like to do this in a way that's easier instead of this really hard way that everyone else seems to be doing it. You're almost instantly in an interpersonal reality where you have to start communicating things. And if you don't know how to do that, you'll be a lone essentialist. You'll be, you'll be trying to make a change on your own, and you won't have the influence that you need to be able to actually bring about a team change or a culture change or a relationship change. And so I think in some ways the, there's the, this net missing and necessary piece where people have to learn the skills of interpersonal influence. Yeah. And there's a missing piece. There's a missing piece. Uh, look, at, look at the basic interpersonal communication. Uh, f first, speaking. Like how much time have you spent learning to speak? You've been taught how to speak. You've been corrected if you said it wrong. Uh, people will still correct you today. If you pronounce a word wrong today, someone will correct you today. I don't think that's how you say that. Um, you know, there's dictionaries. Look up how to say it. 
Okay, that's just speaking. What about writing? Just think of the formal education that you and I have had in writing. Yes. Uh, ABCs and then formal schooling and then writing essays and getting actual feedback and written feedback. And this isn't how this goes. And here's the structure and here's how you do it. And then if you write a book, I mean, now you're going through the whole process again. Uh, you've got an editor who's, who's going through and helping you to construct ideas and how to write. And, uh, you know, so, so whether, you know, speaking, uh, writing, reading the same, think of the formal work that's gone into that. Now, the final piece, listening. <laughs> well, how much formal education have people had in that? Zero. It's basically actually zero. So that is a huge problem in an interpersonal reality, in an interdependent reality in the world. I think Where, you can make the argument that these days you have people talking at each other. My wife and I have talked about that a lot, where we feel like conversation is dying. And it's like, I'm talking at you and you're talking at me, but we're not really conversing. That seems to have really become almost an epidemic in the last decade. I, I watched a while ago on some news, news program, um, four or five people on a panel, all actually talking, actually all at the same time. <laughs> I don't mean one or two of them were. I don't mean two talking over each other. I mean actually the entire panel talking at the same time. That's an unbelievable statement uh, of interpersonal communication error. <laughs> well, I mean, that's like, that's like, but that feels like metaphorically true as well. That was literally true, but I think it's metaphorically true for just the noise. Everybody's talking. Everyone's being taught how to talk, how to, how to write, how to read but not how to listen. It, it, and I don't think it's cure-all. I don't think suddenly if you learn how to deeply understand that, and, and develop mutual understanding that that solves everything. No. But do I think it's a pivotal part of the, uh, the human experience? Yes, I do. Do I think it's an underserved element? Yes. Do I think that it's not um, basically... Everybody has a need to be understood. It's our deepest need. And yet nobody has the skill. It is a rare thing for people to have the skill to help people to feel understood. Yeah. And in that, when you don't have a, when a need is not met, it will come out later in uglier ways. It will still be manifest, but, but in, in, uh, in angrier ways. Uh, what an interesting situation where you're reading The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which is one of the all-time, like, last 50 years classic business, yeah. self-development, self-leadership books out well, there. By the way, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but it came out, uh, that's ironic, it came out in 1989, so it's still only 30 years old. Wow. It sold 40 million copies so, so far. <laughs> that's a Those lot of us in publishing this world know what that means, and it's unbelievable. That Carry is on, unbelievable. Please. No, I mean, that's incredible, but you're reading it and you get to meet Stephen Covey. So I have to ask you, because I've never met him. I've read Seven Habits as a reread for me. I think I'm on my third round of it. And I read yeah. it shortly after it came out. What, what did you learn from Stephen Covey? And what was he like? Like, I'd love to, to give us your impressions. Um, uh, there's lots of impressions. And I feel a little... I feel a little emotional about it, but not because, not because somehow there was no weakness in him or something like that. It was just, yeah. just plenty of that. But he was, um, um, I mean, he was, he was the real deal. I will say that. He was so um, sincere about wanting to bring light and truth to the world. Mm. And it was his every waking breath was trying to do that. Uh, what I, I mean, he, you know, like we can start with some of the basic things, right? I mean, he, he, he lived what he taught in his family where it counted, you know, he was not someone you know, preaching from the, you know, from the rooftops. And then when you actually look at the family, you're like, Oh, well, you know, yeah. he's on the edge of a divorce or he's he wrecked relationship with his kids. No, I, I know. Um, not all of his children well, but I know some of his children well, and, and they all talk, the way they talk about their dad 
is just amazing. Amazing. Mm. Seriously. They, to a person, they talk about, um, I mean, I knew, they, one said, I just knew my, my dad just loved me unconditionally. I never, I never had to question that ever. Mm. I mean, that's, that, that, that kind of thing repeated all over the place. So we're uh, Yeah, I'll go even further that they, they talk about him almost still in the present tense in an unusual yeah. way. That it's, un, it's not unusual for them just to talk about like, yeah, I know dad's really pleased with me about this that I'm working on right now. I can feel, I can feel his support of me working on this book or doing this project or, uh, or, or this thing I'm trying to do in the world. It, 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 it's like this of closeness that is almost, well, not almost, this is like beyond, like lived on, the influence is lived on. Um, the thing that most impressed me personally with him wasn't what he wrote about. Uh, it was what he was, what he aspired to was what was most game changing for me, what was most catalytic and still is. Uh, and, and that was that he was, I mean, he was really trying to teach. First of all, he was trying to reach the whole world. I mean, he was serious about that. And he was trying to teach world leaders as he went. So before he died, he had taught personally, taught 50 heads of state around the world. Wow. And that perspective changed and shaped me sort of early on in my career. Um, I was like, yeah, I want to do that work. And that's one of the reasons that I got involved in the World Economic Forum uh, and, and, you know, started working, you know, in the white young global leader group is because I just thought, yeah, I want to, if you're going to coach anyone, maybe there's ways to be useful at, at a, at a dif disproportionate level, right? Mm -hmm. Leverage. Uh, same same skill sets, but at a different level. Uh, and so I was very impressed by by what he was doing with that. Um, and uh, and yeah, so it's uh, I've, I've yeah, those are some of my impressions about. Oh, that's that's great. Man. And and do you think this deep listening and that mm -hmm. formative experience? Because one of the things I think you you have the ability to do in essentialism and effortless is you seem to be able to cut through the noise really, really well and simplify mm. things. I, I think I told you this before, but I remember reading Essentialism. I picked up a hardback copy. I was flying to Europe and it was, you know, a six hour read on the plane. Like I, I finished it before we touched down. I think we were going to Amsterdam or Paris or something. Wow, and I remember thinking, you. oh my goodness, this is going to change my life. And I sent copies to friends immediately. Like, have mm -hmm. you heard about this book? You need to read it, which is probably, you know, I wasn't alone in that reaction. That's how you sell a million books, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it was, it was so clarifying. Do you think deep listening has something to do with your ability to see through the noise? Um, I mean, it's uh, a simple answer, yes. Yeah. I, I think simple answer to that is yes. And it is, it's a presumptuous answer for me because it means that I'm accepting the, you know, the premise that I'm good at that and so on. But I, I, I think that that's, that's kind of where this difference between this, this listening without impact, this low impact listening versus this high impact listening. I think that's one of the differences is low impact listening, like level one influence is where you're not really getting anywhere. You yeah. just stand sitting at the top surface level and someone's talking and talking and you're just, okay, you're just there and they, it's just sort of hitting you or, you know, it's not saying anything, you're not interrupting them. High impact listening is about getting to clarity. That's mm -hmm. what the goal is. You want to understand more and more precisely, more and more deeply. So actually you would interrupt someone, but not to tell them your view. So it's not just interruption, but interrupt to clarify. So when I'm listening to people, it's almost, um, it's almost a visual experience for me, hmm. where as they're talking, it's like there's images of what they're describing are in my, in my head, not the stories they're telling, it's different to that. And I can't quite explain it, but, but it's, it's like, a, 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 like O's and ones. Like, you know, sometimes you see that on a screen. It's like that. So that, that, that I'm like, it's almost meditative. I'm lost in their world. I'm not in my world. I'm not in my head. I'm in their world. I mean, I'm trying to exist in their 
state uh, in their perspective and and so as people are talking you start to anticipate oh i think they're probably going here with that thought so then when they don't say what you're expecting i i need to interrupt now okay i thought you were going to say this but you said this instead can you talk to me about that hmm. i want to understand whether they avoided something and went to something easier or more surface or whether i just misunderstood what they were saying so so you you you're trying to cut through the clutter yeah that, that that's po powerful listening is cutting through the clutter for example let me tell you someone who i think is a powerful listener became a powerful listener is is steve jobs hmm. and that's someone who the media version of him was you'd never put him in that category Oh, he's just, he's just a jerk. He's just yelling at everyone. He's just, you know, just telling everyone what to do. Uh, and that's obviously there's some truth to that story. Sure. But he evolved enormously as a leader over a 10 year period in between being kicked out of Apple and coming back. And one of the things he was developing in that time was greater, greater, uh, you know, persuasive listening. Hmm. And, and that's why he could be so impactful. Yeah. When he stands up giving a presentation, as he did, I was just re-watching this recently, he was giving a presentation on when he first launched Think Different campaign. Mm -hmm. And that, pre you know, there's just like five, 10 minutes preamble it gives as to why they're doing this and how they got to it. And it's so powerful, it's so mesmerizing. And it reaches you and it touches you. Why? Because he is in an empathic state, he's in this. He's he is naming things for people that they themselves haven't had to name yet. That's what a good author does. You name things that other people go, "Oh yeah, I, I, I that's right." You know, I hadn't put words to it, but that's what I experienced. You're naming what's going on in their world. Uh, I'll give you another example. Uh, maybe it's not as relatable for some people. I don't know, but like. A lot of people misjudge, I think, why Oprah was so impactful. Let's take her book club, for example. I mean, a lot of people think that she had influence, so she would say, everyone should read this book. And then everyone said, okay, we'll read that book. And you see it as like one-way influence. I am influencing you. I am telling you what to do, and you do it. But actually, her process was this. She would spend an hour every day at the end of her show after the recording is over asking questions of her audience interacting with her audience listening i didn't to know that wow yeah, nobody knows this just about and that's how she kept the pulse on her audience throughout 25 years of this phenomenon show hmm. uh, she credits that as being the most important practice so when she was deciding what book to put on a book club the question she was asking was what would one in ten of my audience want to read so she's not just dictating, hey, everyone should do this thing. She's yeah. saying, from what I know, by listening every day to my audience, do they already want? Now I will recommend that to them. I'll, I'll help curate something I know they already want. And that explains her. Now you could call her a 10Xer. And again, we've got to find better language probably than these. But I like but, that language. Know, she's, she's a 100Xer. She's a 1,000Xer. Yeah, I yeah. don't know what it is, right? But she was reaching 100 million people a week for the height of her show. That you don't do that by just getting good at speaking and trying to tell people stuff. No, you will limit your influence at that point. It's all your, it's it's all this deep listening uh, skill, and and not just hey, I have good skills interpersonally, but developing practices and systems around it so that you listen and you understand your understanding intelligence, your UI, <laughs> right. Uh, you, you, you know, your it is it is so advanced. This system of understanding is so much better uh, than, uh, than 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 other people. This is the difference between one X and ten X influence. I, I I'll just drop a little editorial comment in here because um, this I'm so glad that we captured all of this for leaders. But I think a couple of 
dots are connecting in my head, Greg, that you're really bringing together for the first time. There's a big debate about social media. A lot of leaders who are now realizing, particularly after the pandemic, it's like, oh my goodness, I have to be online. I have to start a podcast. We have to start live streaming, et cetera, et cetera. But it tends to be broadcasting. And so when you're saying you're doing that coaching or those sessions on on your show that are deep listening, and you have a new subscriber today, that's me. So just so you know, (laughs) I'll be listening. Um, But I think that answers the question, like, uh, you know, I heard somebody once say about a younger millennial who said, listen, we don't download content, we upload it which I think is a really interesting thought, but there's that idea of, of fostering a dialogue. And I think there's a lot of frustrated leaders who are like, why is no one listening to me? Why can't I get a million <laughs> downloads, right? Why, why have I not gone viral? And maybe it's like, well, actually the way you get listened to is you listen to others and you really interact. I don't know. Does that resonate at all, Greg? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just writing it down. It's a question I have heard many times, but I, you're just saying it. Why is no one listening to me? I mean, yeah. that's it. Everyone wants to be listened to. Everyone wants to be ah, heard. Ah, there you go. So if you just become one more person who always wants to be heard, then you're just part of the noise. You're, it's like the blue, it's like the red ocean strategy, you know, in, in red ocean versus blue ocean strategy, right? The idea is everyone's, the sharks are all fighting over the same fish that makes the water, bl- you know, red yeah. from the blood of the fish. Blue ocean strategy is don't fight over there, fight somewhere else, go do a different, go, it's kind of an effortless idea where you're saying like, like, don't fight over the same stuff, go create something new that no one else is arguing for. Cirque du Soleil, it's a completely new category. No one can even, no one's competing with you. Uh, you just go over and create a different thing. I think in a similar way, it's like when you say, well, no one is listening to me. Uh, it's like, yeah, you look at the opportunity you have, <laughs> go listen. You become a powerful listener uh, and not a strategic listener. So you're not, again, just going down one level of influence. You go up, for example. Um, we talked, I think, off air uh, mm. about uh, about quitting law school. Uh, that you yeah. finished law school. Uh, you, were, you were more successful than me. I quit early. Wow. Uh, and, um, and, but, but there's somebody who became a barrister in England and he might have stayed a barrister, but he had a family emergency come up in South Africa. So he travels to South Africa. And while he's in South Africa, he's on the train. He's first class because he's an he's Englishman. He's part of the British Empire and he's, he's bought right. tickets to go there. And, he, and they kick him off the train because he's not allowed to be there and he won't leave. And it's in the middle of apartheid. And so he, he's not allowed to be there. And, and he fights the law. He spends 23 years in the Phoenix Settlement. Uh, it's just south of, uh, just, just outside of Durban. Uh, and he is successful. He wins. Now, he goes to India, back to India after this, the home of his birth, but not a place he'd been for a long time. And people wanted him to run for office there. They wanted him to kick the British out, basically, but through becoming a political leader. And this is, this is, this is where, this is where essentialism and effortless shift into like a slightly different gear into the gear we're talking about because he says no to them and the reason he says no is he's like that's not going to work anyway you all of you are already fighting about this you're already screaming and arguing you're already everyone's out trying to outdo each other um it's obviously doing it the hard way you're doing it the hard way it's not working the british are still here and you have not been successful and if i come and join your strategy just pushing harder on this same rock up the hill, I won't help anything. And mm. even if I, even if I became the most, if, you know, politically, you know, if I became the president, the prime minister, the, the title leader, I still wouldn't know what to do. So I'd have power without clarity. So that's not mm. good either. And then I'd just be the loudest person doing the unhelpful thing. What he does, what's key to being, to putting, uh, you know, a strategy together that works, in other words, to do what's essential in a way that's as easy, as effortless as possible, something that works, uh, he walks. He, he spends a year traveling India, listening. Uh, not a not a sort of a little political tour, like a gimmick. Oh, I've been on a listening tour for a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but for a year, walking, listening, and what he finds is the most essential thing, that little red button, so to speak, was salt. 
Um, the British salt, controlled like S A L T. S A L T. They controlled the production of the British controlled the production of salt, and what it turns out is if you can do that, you actually control a lot of stuff. You control production of bread and the whole food chain. Hmm. It was really important leverage. And so as he understood that, it's infinitesimally small, but it turns out to be infinitely important. He says, okay, well, I'm going to, that's my focus now. My focus will be on this unfair leverage. And so he walks across India in a demonstration of civil disobedience to make salt at the beaches. It became known as the Salt March because uh, he'd identified the thing that actually resonated and 600,000 people followed it. Wow. So the key to this breakthrough influence was first being influenced. Hmm. It was his ability and his discipline to go and listen, to go and understand. Not even just listening in the interpersonal skill way, it's understand what's going on here. Something's going on and I need to identify the levers that are disproportionately affecting this. How is it possible that so few British can control so many Indians so effortlessly? Right. <laughs> and how can I construct a system that will help us to achieve what we need to do also as effortlessly as possible? Now, I don't mean that he didn't put effort in any more than I'm arguing in effortless that you shouldn't put effort in. It's how do you use your effort? That's the point. It's not all effort is created equal. Right, And if you put effort in the wrong place, you won't get any results. You'll just burn yourself out and still not achieve what you want. Just like all these other politicians were doing in India at the time. Gandhi, who we're talking about here, hmm. is able to bring about independence to the largest democracy in the world with no war. Talk about an effortless solution. Wow. The leverage of his impact is so immense. I mean, when he died, it was the general, it was the secretary of state, general George C. Marshall, the U.S. Secretary of State, who said, here is a man who has shown that simplicity can be more powerful than empires. He'd become more powerful than empires. How did he do that? Yeah. Did he do it by gaining tremendous wealth? No, mm. completely not the other, other way. Did he do it by having titled power in a system, in an existing hierarchy? No. He never had a title of any kind. It just became later, after, sort of unofficially, uh, right. the, the father of India. Uh, did he do it by, like, what, what, how, where did the power come from? Mm. To, to be able to achieve that much impact with that little harm. Uh, Einstein said of Gandhi, generations to come will scarce believe that such a one as this ever in flesh and blood walked upon this earth. <laughs> wow. You know, this is, this is like uh, just, I'm so glad we went there and let this roll because, first of all, I hope you write the book. Secondly, this is rare wisdom and it seems to be so counter-cultural, which I think is sort of the you know, the movement of your writing. I love how you, you know, it's not a religious book. You, you share faith as so do I. Um, but, you know, you open with Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And uh, you close the book with that as well, which I thought was really interesting. And I think you could look in the lives of Jesus or the life of, of Gandhi and see that simplicity and even Oprah's listening to her. I listened to a whole audio biography of Oprah and like, I did not know that. And mm. that there is so much power in that. And I think for leaders who are so, most of the people who listen to the show are trying to gain influence, right? Like, let's just be honest. That's what leaders do, but it's a very overlooked aspect of influence. And I think it gives you some of the ability to cut through the noise uh, I got to ask you, because we should probably talk about your books at some point, Greg, I think, you know, it'd be helpful. Um, is there anything else you want to say on that? Because I do have a couple of essentialism and effortless questions. You got the whole list. We haven't, we haven't well, hit one of them yet, but this I mean, is now, so rich. Now, now that you're asking about, now that you, you, you make the bridge to, to Jesus, um, I mean, like, there's so many interesting things here. I've been watching The, um, the Chosen along with everybody else. Oh, yeah. No, I have not seen that yet. Oh, yeah. You're going to love that. Okay. Um, yeah, you guys just got to watch that. Uh, but 
But well, one of the things they have, I mean, it's obviously it's it, it's fictionalized, but it's well researched and stuff. There's plenty of stuff that you think is fictionalized, and then when you go back and actually read it and go, wow, did they? How much poetic license they take? You go, oh no, actually, it's right there. Uh, all sorts of things like that that you think missed it. Yeah. You think are like, oh, that is in the story. So it's they're very powerful the way they've had. I think had us to reimagine and be able to go, what would this really have perhaps really been like? Mm. Uh, not not a stoic. Not not a Jesus that's so stoic and and distant that you can't relate. Yes, uh, it's exactly. Very, it's a kind of stiff Hollywood and yeah. unique version. Right. Uh, this is very warm. Well, it's what it is. I think the versions that you often see are conservative, because you want not to. You that you, you don't want to make the error. People don't want to make the error of 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 somehow attributing a fault to him that isn't there. And and so I think that conservative bent means that you go you sort of remove the personality too um and and i don't think that's you know that, that's very helpful people don't you don't get people to roar like lions for the rest of their lives after you're dead by being so stoic and unemotional and and, and no personality like that 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 is inconsistent yeah. with everything everything we know about leadership and impact that there's mm. not that isn't conceivable connection in my yeah. view yeah yeah you know, th these people that you know they roared like lions for the rest of their lives to their deaths you, you had to feel something different anyway right. the the thing that there's one of the, the the accounts in it is watching jesus talking to his cousin john the baptist and john's just like so impatient with him really not not terribly, but he's like, when are you going to go? You know, like, when are you going to do what you need to do? It's been 30 years. Like, and he's like, look, you know, in time. What's he doing through all that time? What's he doing for 30 years? What's he doing for the 40 days and 40 nights up on the, in, the, in, in, in the desert fasting before the Sermon on the Mount? What's he doing there? He's listening. Mm. He's listening to his father. He's listening for the right words, he's, he's, he's not just spouting off. And, and so to me, I mean, listening, there's, there's levels of it, right? There's, you got to listen first, like the very first thing is it's inside out. You got to listen for the spirit, for conscience, for revelation, what, what is right. Then in a way you have to put that aside so you can listen to other people, but not listen just to what they're saying. You're creating space for them to be able to listen to their voice, to their conscience. You're not trying to, you're not trying just to listen going, I think, I think I got what you said. I get it. No, you're creating space so they can hear what they can't currently hear because it's too noisy in their heads. Uh, and, and then together you can understand, you know, you get edified together, you understand each other, and you can do things, amazing things together. That to me seems like the order. Listening right first yourself, then creating space for other people to listen to themselves, then together you can communicate at a higher level. Now, that's a really impactful framework. I do, I do hope you write that book. I don't know if that's <laughs> the next one or the one after that, but we need that book, Greg. I need that book. I'm, I'm learning as I get better as a leader. That, and that, that's been one of the secrets to podcasting, kind of bring this full circle to the point of where we started, is I'm learning. And that's why I do everything via video, even before we started broadcasting video. Um, I just need to shut up. And the interviews where I shut up the most often turn out to be the best because, you know, as somebody who's, who's interviewed frequently on very major platforms, you're always cutting to commercial. The interviewer has an agenda. You got to get the talking points for your book out in eight minutes or less. And I find with this kind of long form podcasting, you can just go down some rivers and tributaries that a lot of other people don't get to. And, and the way I've, I learned to phrase it is, uh, if you listen longer than most people listen, you will hear things most people never hear. And I've, I've had texts from people who have worked alongside leaders I've interviewed who are like, worked with this guy for 20 years, never heard him talk about that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of guests who are like, yeah, I've never talked about this publicly before. And I'm not trying to get a scoop. I'm just trying to have a really interesting conversation. So that is an active um, intent learning area for me.
What were you, what were you saying? No, no, I was just hearing what you were saying. That's an intent yeah. for you. Something it's an intent. You... Yeah, me too. Hmm. Um, I feel, I feel this desire now still to just get better at it. I mean, you mentioned the other books, right? Essentialism and Effortless. And one of the things Stephen taught me is he said, most authors begin with their own mind in mind. Ah. He says, but they've got to begin with the reader's mind in mind. And I spend a disproportionate amount of my life um, when I'm writing in that category. Right. Trying well, whether I'm when you're a about it. Well, go ahead. What was that? Trying to listen, trying to pay attention to what the listener is thinking, what the reader is yeah, thinking. Yeah, like, like one concrete example about that for me is I obsess about the title and, 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 um, and cover design. Hmm. And the reason I do, that doesn't mean everyone likes them, uh, but the reason I do that is because that's the first thing the reader will experience. Right. So I want to try and tell a story in the cover. I want to be able to, so that somebody, so the person this is intended for feels something as soon as they see it. They go, oh yeah, oh yeah. I, 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 that's relevant for me right now. Oh yeah, my life's too complicated. We've got to get this simpler. I think there's an easier way. Maybe there's an easier way. The, like, so that's an example of how I'm trying to, to do that. Um, and, and all the way through the book, you, you're trying to say, what's the, what's the story that would be most relevant for this reader right now? If they were struggling, what would they need to hear? And that's the journey. You're really in service of them. It isn't, I, I do know someone who wants so badly to be listened to, to be heard. Hmm. And actually, I think he has a lot to say. I think he has things that could be very useful, but is so focused on this that he just is not effective right now. Hmm. Unfortunately, he just and he and I think it burns him up because he's he's been successful in lots of ways, uh, and so I think he feels like well, people should just want to hear. They should just want to. They should just come and ask me questions. They should just want to get what I know, and it just isn't like that. Mm. Um, so I yeah. resonate with that. Um, so you had a surprise. Um, one of my favorite insights, you know, a couple of things just always stick in your mind about pivotal books that you've read, but if it's not a nine, it's a zero. That's mm. become an axiom with our team over the last few years. Scale of one to 10, is this a good thing? And most of us get caught in sixes, seven and eights. Easy to say no to a two out of 10 request. Um, 10 out of 10 is kind of, yeah, are you kidding? This is a dream list. I can get uh, this guy on my podcast. Yes, I'm available, right? That kind of thing. Yep. But it's true. I've, I've been dying in six, sevens, and eights where you want to be a nice guy. You want to help someone out, but it's challenging. And, you know, and my nine keeps changing. So the problem is in a growing platform is what was a nine two years ago might be a seven today. That's right. Or a six. And what's a nine or a 10 today could be a seven or an eight tomorrow. So that's a, that's a lasting thing. You only covered it, I think, in a sentence or two here, but you said after essentialism, you shocked yourself because you found yourself in a season of overwhelm and burnout, almost like living the opposite of the message that you had just shared with so many people. Do you mind talking about that a little bit? I found that really yeah, interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I was being more selective than I'd ever been. Um, mm -hmm. So you'd been and doing things, the, if it's not a nine, it's a zero, being super yeah, selective. I mean, in, in the name of that, I'd done things like, um, uh, I, I stopped teaching, you know, I put on heights as a class I co-created at Stanford that was very popular. Uh, and there was a, like, a desire to continue it, a uh, demand for doing it. So it was a little odd to, to go, okay, no time out on this. I wasn't writing another book. I mean, in the publishing world, you're, you're supposed to write a book every you know, every 18 months, two years, and the demand was there and the interest was there, and I just still didn't do that. So that was, you know, it's been seven years from essentialism to effortless, right? So it's a, it's a long time in that world. Um, but despite all these kinds of things, I still found myself going, there's a lot of responsibilities, you know, including being father of essentialism. I was now father of four children. There's all those responsibilities too. So you, you've just got a lot going on. And I just, I was thinking about the metaphor, we've, most of us have heard it, uh, the big rocks theory, uh, mm -hmm. where if you have a container and you put in the, the big rocks first, then small rocks, then the sand, it all fits. Correct. If yeah. you get the water wrong, if you put the unimportant stuff in first, the sand, and then try and shove the important things at the end, it won't fit. 
But I found myself saying, well, yeah, but sometimes you do the first, you, 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 you put the most important things first, you put the essential things in first, but what if there are just too many big rocks? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, you can be more selective, and I still believe that. You can always keep being more selective, but you also have to find a way to, you, you gotta find new strategy for that situation. Right. Uh, or you just aren't gonna get some of these big rocks. So something really important isn't going to get done. It's essential, it's vital, it matters, but it's just not gonna get done. Mm -hmm. uh, and so right in the midst of that, I have a family emergency come up where my, um, my daughter is suddenly very, uh, you know, very sick and un with an undiagnosed uh, condition. And it turned out to be a neurological disease. Uh, and she goes from just a picture of health um, just thriving, just absolutely thriving mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically. She's on the, she's on the, uh, rock climbing team. She's always up trees. She's naming chickens. She's reading literally hundreds of books. Um, she's just funny, outgoing. And then suddenly almost overnight, she's, um, it's like, she's just total slow motion, uh, mm. so loss of personality. Um, I'm so sorry. The, the, she, she takes two minutes to write her own name, um, 45 seconds to write the last three letters of her name. I recorded it, you know, just trying to uh, make sense of what's going on and have some you know, data trail. Um, and it went on and on like this, right? So this is, this is weeks and into months that we're, we're, we've got, you know, no neurologist can give us even, you know, one of them just shrugged his shoulders, you know, cause all the tests would come up back in the normal range. And so now what was, okay, this is kind of a lot going on, a little overwhelming. Suddenly you're just like, okay, the whole thing breaks now, or at least could break. You know, the, the, how do you, how do you, how are you an essentialist in this circumstance? Or what do you have to do? What's the additional thing? And I found myself go, yeah, essentialism is necessary, but insufficient. There's another piece to it, or there's a piece that you can go more deeply into. Um, and, and the way that showed up for me was like, there were two paths. What was essential was, was as clear as it was before, maybe even clearer. Uh, we did let some additional things go that we thought were important. And we go, actually, with new perspective, those aren't important, but we've still got mm -hmm. all this left. And, and how do we do it? And I suddenly saw there was two parts, not one. That Previously, it's like, just figure out what's essential, eliminate not, what's not, go. Uh, and I understood suddenly, no, there's a second path. It's a second path. It's a, a lighter path, an easier path. There's a different way to do life. And we needed it to discover it. To survive it you know the test is so big you go okay we, we if we just try and grind our way through this we might just grind up our marriage we might just grind up our culture and our family we might just become depressed and depleted and and break and and if that happens eve is done for because if you if you break down if your culture breaks down if you just take this heavier complex path and you burn out you know, in, in the ways I'm describing, you, you get even less likely to be able to help her, less likely to be able to mm -hmm. turn the right path. And so very mercifully, we just even understood there was a different way of going about it. And, and that looked like very different than the first path. Uh, instead of complaining and worrying and being discouraged and grinding all day and night, reading articles and going after every possible solution to helping you get better, it looks like uh, we would get around the piano and sing. Uh, we would eat dinner together and laugh. We would play together. We would be healthy together. We would laugh. We would pray together. We would, it was just like, let's get in a good, healthy state. Let's do all we can. Let's be grateful so we can maintain what I now call an effortless state. Instead of being in a state of suffering, let's be in an effortless state. So that in that effortless state, you can discern better which things to even do. So you can do, take effortless action. Instead of this, you know, the temptation, let's, let's pursue every possible lead. Let's meet with 20 different neurologists. Right. Let's read every article anyone sends We're up us. We're 20 hours a day trying to heal my daughter, right? That's right. Instead of that, you're in an effortless state, you take effortless action. What's, what's the right next step? Let's not worry about the thousandth step. What's the right next one? I remember Anna going, I just feel like we need to go after this one neurologist who had a nine-month waiting list. Uh, you know, but that's the right person. But just you have a feeling about that. How do you, if you're in a 
certain state of complaint and pain and suffering, you won't even get that little prompting. You'll miss that revelatory moment. And, and, and so everything gets more and more complicated and harder and harder, and you get fewer and fewer options and more and more stuck. That's one path. This other path, okay, because we can breathe, we can see, we're at peace, we can see the next step. Okay, we'll meet with him. And that, and it, it just, it, we saw like a magical force at play. And I think it was key to, to the, well, it was key to the breakthroughs that ended up really helping her. And so- Yeah, she's doing a little better now. Like, yeah, she's, she's thriving again now. I mean, as of this conversation, she is, yeah, she's back. Um, it's been a two and a half year journey. And wow. we don't know if, we don't know, you know, we don't know what's around the, the bend. There's already been, you know, the, the symptoms returned after a successful treatment. And uh, so, so we don't know how long the journey is, but that's all the more reason to use your effort in a particular way. To Glad to hear that. Your chances of, of, of results. You have a lot of great diagrams and charts in the book. One of the ones that really got me, because, you know, it's one of those see your life flash before your eyes moment is uh, there's, a ty- there's a dichotomy between, you know, the effortless and non-effortless state, but massive efforts that produce tiny results versus yeah. tiny efforts that produce massive results. I'm right. like, oh yeah, that's so true. W- what, is, what is the difference? What's underneath that? Yeah, uh, the, I think the thing, I think the breakthrough idea there is that not all effort is created equal. Mm that effort and reward are not linearly related. We want them to be. Right. And we oversimplify in thinking that's how it is. It feels like fair. So if you want X results, you work X hard. So therefore, if you want 10X results, it follows logically, you should just put 10X effort in and that's how you get the outcome you want. Uh, But for loads of reasons, that isn't how it works. So if you're successful and you want to become very successful, the answer is not to just do what you're currently doing, but tons more of it. That is just not going to work. You will, you will run out of space before that strategy works. So what it looks like is saying, okay, I have this finite amount of effort. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a pretty limited resource. How do I use it to leverage a far better reward, far mm. better result? I keep talking about 10x in this conversation. I don't normally talk about it as much as we do today, but but that's kind of a good test. Is saying, does the strategy I have, it, it can, is it scalable? Can I 10x it? And when people are just solving stuff through, okay, well, I'll just put in more hours. It's like, well, yeah, that's fine, but you are going to run out. So you can't 10x that. What, what you can do instead is you can find a new strategy, a different way of doing this. You can use your effort to create to create a system that works for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my favorite illustrations of this is um, a friend of mine, Jessica Jackley, who went with a few other people. She's in Africa. She's trying to make a difference there. Um, and she meets a, an entrepreneur who uh, was c- couldn't get ahead yeah. in her life because she just is always at just survival. She's just selling produce on the side of the road. So that's, mm-hmm. That is her job. That's her business. And so she has to be there every single day to sell that produce, to make just enough money, subsistence level, to be able to feed her family. And that's her life every single day. It's just repetition of the same thing. So I love this story because it's like effortless results on two, in, in two ways. First of all, it's like, how do you help her to get a system that works for her? Right. Rather than just, she's, in, she's getting linear results, meaning she has to, she puts in effort every day and she gets that result every day. Every, if she doesn't put in the effort today, she doesn't get a result. That is a linear result. Hmm. How do you help her to get residual results? Well, what she needs is to be able to go and, and build a system. For her, that system is go meet with the, not the middleman, who she's buying from, but go to the actual, go to the people who are actually buying, you know, to, to the fisher, to, to the fisheries, yeah. you know, to the originators of the produce and negotiate with them supply so that she can sell at a, a profit uh, and then therefore get ahead. 
What she needs for that is $500, which seems like a very small investment from a, from a Western point of view, and it is. But that will make the difference. Now she'll create a system where results, even tiny effort, will produce loads of results because the system right. is working in her favor. Now, Jessica Jackley comes, enters the scene, and she thinks, well, $500, I can do that. We can get $500 for her to help her to, to, to do this. But then she thinks, or at least the group combined, I don't know who had the thought, but they, they basically suddenly go, but what if, what if instead of helping one person, what if we created a system that produced the results we want instead of it being just dependent on us being here, getting $500 and giving it? So they have inspired by the Grameen Bank uh, and Muhammad Yunus and, and so on, like they were like, well, what if we created a system of micro loans and they started a group called Kiva, kiva.org. Mm -hmm. And instead of that $500, let me tell you what that's grown to. $1.3 billion in loans now. That's incredible. In micro loans for developing nations. 97% repayment of those loans. Man. Perpetually loaned out. That, 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 that's what, that is what I mean when I say effortless results. So Greg, that's so helpful. Okay, because I know you've given this interview many, many times. Uh, many of my listeners listen to multiple podcasts, so you'll get the whole book pitch and I would encourage you to buy it. But you talk about effortless state, effortless action, and effortless results. Um, and I think all three are essential. I'd love to jump to uh, rest. Rest mm -hmm. is so hard for leaders. And when it comes to an effortless state, do you want to talk about what you learned about rest and why that's so essential? Because you're right. When I was a young leader, it was like more, more hours equals more, you know, more people equals more hours, more hours equals more results. And I realized that blew up in my face and I burned out. So why is rest so critical? Well, we've been conned into believing that one hour less sleep equals more, one hour more productivity. Because mm -hmm. we're still thinking almost like caveman type sophistication in our mental model of results. We're just saying, okay, well, if I put in one hour of effort, it gets me a result. If I put in 10, I get 10 units of results and so on. We just keep, we think that's the only scalable um, right. factor. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very, it's like a factory-based logic where you say, well, if the factory produces is on for an hour, it produces this. If it's on for 50 hours, it produces 50x. And, and that's actually pretty true. Uh, we, the thing is that we're just not factories, right? So we're not machines. So that, so I've that really important distinction is important, but we are actually, a lot of us and a lot of businesses and are still stuck in an industrial age type view of, of, of workers. And so we, we think of uh, people as cogs in a wheel. I mean, we even use this kind of language. I mean, it's very factory-based approach. And, and, and that gets, you know, you can see that in things like 1980s motivational speakers, you know, just do more, you just kill yourself, you're just going to go for it. You see it in the same type of logic in, in sports teams, even elite sports teams where no pain, no gain. Mm -hmm. And this is all the same kind of idea. It's like, it's just treating people like machines and we're not we're so therefore as soon as you break through that and you go oh actually though we're you know what what are the what are actually the factors that drive peak performance in leaders you say well it isn't any of those things those things are right. actually really damaging they can be helpful to just to a certain extent maybe it's what got you here you know maybe it's how you got to success but it is not what will make you very successful um, Warren Buffett does not work a thousand times harder than anyone listening to us. Right. So that's you, not you reference him as having lazy investing, isn't it? Like we take the laziest approach or something like that. Is yeah, that he, said, he said. Yeah. He said our, our 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 investment strategy borders on lethargy. <laughs> yeah. He says I wrote it in effortless that he said we're not looking for seven foot fences to leap over. I'm looking for one foot fences I can step over. Wow. Yeah, that is the most successful investor in the world. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Sam, like Gandhi. That's, that's like Gandhi and salt, right? It's like, oh, I discovered like Gandhi and salt. Exactly yeah. so. 
So you, you've got whether it is, is whether it's Ghanaian salt, whether it's uh, Warren Buffett. This is we're we're looking at a different way of like how do humans thrive? How do how does how do you actually construct systems that work in your favor? I was just had Dr. Wells on my podcast, and he he works with elite athletes. And he says, we don't, we absolutely do not believe and haven't done the research, hasn't supported no pain, no gain for 20 years. He says, what we teach instead, I love this phrase, is um, we want to teach people how to run fast, not hard. Hmm. Run fast, not hard. That's a great slogan. You want the progress. You don't want to get beaten up. If you're getting beaten up by your process, you've got bad process. Your system isn't working well yet. Uh, I just, I, I, you know, so yeah. So rest is part of building a system that enables you to actually slingshot your performance forward. You want a system in your life that it helps you to sleep at night. You know, good sleep is, is, is highest quality sleep you can have. Yeah. Uh, and then also for me at least, uh, personally, I, I'm like, not always 100% on the getting enough sleep at night, but I'm a champion napper. And it's good <laughs> too. Because, because the research supports this, that you can, the, the right nap at the right time can have as much uh, impact to your ability to learn, to grow, to develop as a full night's sleep. So it's, it's, it can be incredibly rejuvenating if done right. Uh, and, and some of the most important impactful people in the, in the history of the world, just like, Actually, if you study them, sometimes they, people think of them as operating in a certain kind of no pay, no gain, give everything all the time, burn yourself out way. But actually, uh, they, they spent loads of their time in rest, recuperation, thinking, pausing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Winston Churchill uh, as, a, as an example. Uh, he yeah. took a nap every day. Didn't think it counted as an app unless he actually like really took his like clothes off and like just it wasn't like just lying on a couch somewhere. It was like in bed, full nap. He said he thought he, he estimated he get could get twice the productivity out of a day because he took a nap. That just yeah, illustrates some... that just illustrates the, the, the idea. Rest rest is part of the cycle, it's part of the rhythm of achievement, and you want systems in your life that help you achieve those rhythms. Any final idea from Effortless? And again, we got the uh, the the short version of it here because of the rich conversation that led into this. But any other idea? I would encourage leaders to pick it up. I'll be buying multiple copies for for people. It's a great book. And you're right. Sometimes the answer, well, often the answer is not more, 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 harder, harder, harder. It is less. And it's in the listening. It's in the silence. It's in making things easy. And even you have got a whole chapter on fun which is one of the reasons I think you and a mutual friend, John Acuff, get along so well, right? Oh, like, I like uh, that. Guys, uh, John's all about fun. Any he final is. idea you want to leave with leaders as they move into a more effortless state as we wrap up? Yeah, I mean, now that you mentioned John, um, I was reading his newest book, Soundtracks, and Great. read a section in there called Light and Easy. And he said, he was talking about his process of writing this book compared to what it normally was like. He said, in very John fashion, he said, my wife came to me and she said, you're a, you're a jerk for the two years you're writing a book. Uh, <laughs> and, and then you're a jerk for the two years you're marketing the book. Mm. So like, they, and, and what he is is a writer and, and speaker. So like, that's his whole life. He's like a jerk yeah, writing exactly. and a jerk marketing, right? And so he, he goes, okay. I got to find a different way. He said it used to be that he thought about the process as being, you know, blood, sweat, and tears, mm. as a lot of people do. And writing, there's all sorts of quotes about this. All you have to do to write is uh, is is get up to a typewriter and bleed. You know, <laughs> all yes. sorts of quotes like this. There's all sorts of soundtracks that make us believe, or that, that, well, if it's not hard and suffering, it can't be good. We can't be doing it right. Uh, whereas actually a lot of effective writers uh especially if, if they've especially if they're prolific have found very different ways to write than that i know of one writer who's done you know is, as a ghost writer done many many books um not me i don't i don't have ghost writers but um 
but this was in many, many successful books. And his whole ma his mantra is uh, is two average pages a day. That's his That's goal. pretty good. If you write two average pages a day, then you can write anything. You can write books. You can write many books. It's enormously fast. It's just not what people think of it being. So how can you make it light and easy? And so so this is what John did. He he had. Um, uh, he went and got those shoes that Nike used when they oh, were yeah. getting the two, breaking the two-hour marathon. And mm -hmm. he, whenever he was writing this book, this new book, he would wear those shoes. Those were his writing shoes as a symbol to remind himself, like, don't be so, don't take this all so seriously. Don't be so stressed about this. Be light and easy, light and easy, light and easy in the way that we're, we're writing it, light and easy in the way that we market it. He's just going to enjoy this process. And when I read that, I just loved it because I felt like this was just exactly in the same tone as Effortless. And that's how we became friends was through that. Um, I reached out, like, yep, yeah, I think you've killed it with this book. I think it's going to be very successful. I love this section. And we talked all about that. And we, 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 we stayed now in, in touch. Um, well, it turns out when he was reading Effortless, which came out after his, uh, he read the inscription at the, the beginning, the dedication page, which is, my way is easy, my burden is light. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. And he, he texted me, he's like, are you kidding me? That's where I got light and easy from. Wow. So we got it from, it was like, you know, full circle, really lovely that, that kind of worked in that way. But I love that way of describing it, light and easy. How can I lead in a way that is light and easy? Ah, oh, wouldn't you love to work for a boss that was light and easy? Mm. You're still making progress, but it's light and easy. It's not always burdensome and heavy. And well, we need to get better results, so we got to work harder. No. What if it was, hey, we need to get better results. Let's find a b smarter way of doing it. Let's find an easier way of doing this. How can we build something that will make these results flow to us instead of only through grinding effort? This is the blue ocean strategy. Light and easy is the is 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 the way to be able to not just be less stressed and less suffering, which I think is something. But it's also the way to get to 10x because if you can find an easier, smarter approach, if you can find a way that's 10 times easier to do what you're already doing, then you can achieve 10 times the results. I mean, it's just mm. that's logical. And, uh, and so, so I think I'll leave you on that note, light and easy. That is a fantastic place to rest this round. Greg, it's been uh, a joy <laughs> as it was the first time we chatted. Um, where can people find you? Tell us about your podcast. Obviously, Effortless, available anywhere you can buy books. It's already, it was an instant New York Times bestseller. Um, so where are you these days online? Uh, yeah, look, I think one of the things people could do right now is if, if they go to essentialism.com, they can, they can sign up for a 21-day challenge, which is sort of micro effortless ways to, to focus on what's essential in your life. Uh, I think the offer is still there from the publisher that if people buy Effortless, they can access that whole my, uh, masterclass for free. Um, so I think that's there. That would be one thing. Uh, the podcast, go subscribe. People go subscribe to the What's Essential podcast. We'll, we'll you know, continue the conversation there. Uh, and uh, yeah, those are, those are good places. Thank you, Kerry. It's been really a pleasure. Greg, to it's been a true joy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before.